I'm going to talk about today on a problem that we all have faced as a child. And it's the game of Where's Waldo? Uh, it's basically the game where you have this super large collage where you are trying to find Waldo or depending on the country you are in, Valley. Uh, and it's somewhere in there. And I have looked at this image for a while. I have still not figured out where Waldo is. And NASA faces almost a similar problem. The problem they face is that when a researcher has to work on a real scientific problem, before working on the problem, they have to go and collect data. So here's the life of a PhD researcher uh, trying to mention, trying to find the particular uh, phenomena that they are interested in. For example, here, let's say the researcher is interested in, let's say, wildfires. Great. They clicked on it. They found it. They take a selfie of Earth and they have one image collected where and plus all the metadata. Now they go on this file chase for finding a second example. They found it, two, did, two items collected. Now they have to find the third item and they keep moving the mouse, moving the mouse, moving the mouse. And as you can see, that is a pretty tedious task to do. Maybe they get lucky or maybe this is just a cloud, but let's just assume, imagine that. You could imagine for deep learning, you need really a lot of examples Whereas in this case, finding one, two, or three is taking us so long. Imagine if you had to do that over 197 square miles. And that is one day of data, whereas from satellites, we have 20 years plus of data. And then there are n number of products. Very quickly, this problem becomes pretty unscalable. I think you'll agree with me. So uh, finding similar items what a particular researcher needs is basically the task here. Uh, is, the, is it possible for the researcher to find exhaustively all examples of wildfires, of cyclones, of icebergs breaking, but making an exhaustive collection? So in deep learning, similarity search is a very easy, simple, like one of a beginner task, in fact. But in this case, it becomes slightly harder because number one, the data is ultra large scale. Number two, there is no labels. So usually you come up with a pre-trained network or a network trained on your particular task, which will be really able to find similar conceptual items easily. Problem is we don't have any labels, so how do we even train a network for infrared imagery? Thirdly, uh, there are multiple concepts. So unlike ImageNet where there's like one concept in one place, you could have a hurricane, a desert, an ocean all inside the same image. It becomes harder. And finally, this data is really unbalanced. Oceans, water account for 70% of data, whereas uh, your you know, hurricanes would be like 0 0.0001. So training a network to understand this imbalance becomes harder. Uh, and that's why I think there was some sort of a moonshot challenge to be able to solve this problem. Uh, but then while well, I'm presenting here, so I probably will have a demo ready, right, to show you. So that's what we'll see. So let's say here we go in this example. Here's a real system which is running. Uh, this particular researcher is interested in, let's just say these uh, fluffy clouds, because I don't know what the scientific name for this is. They find it, they search for it, and voila, you know, the system is able to find similar patterns. Keep in mind, none of this data is labeled at all. Okay, maybe the researcher is able, interested in more of a structure where one side is dense and one side is more sparse. And the system kind of picked out you know, those kind of patterns. All right, so the system is making sense. Now, I and mean, we have all have been stuck in this COVID world. Maybe you want to go on this nice vacation. So you'd be looking for you know, those places with the blue, bluest of the blue oceans. So we go and search for that. And uh, let's see what the system is able to find. I think I know my vacation spot already at this point. And that's the power of self-supervised learning. I want to show you one another example which really sells this point across. Um, you know where this evergreen gets stuck every now and then? This area, if you are trying to search for it, the system returned back similar desert ocean desert sandwiches. You know, if you had a classifier, a classifier would not have been able to understand the structure and it would have given you things with an ocean and a desert, but desert, ocean, desert, in this way, I think that's what the power of self-supervised learning is. So now that I've shown you the uh, the story, let's go into a little bit theory. 
So we'll solve this with self-supervised learning, which is basically the area catching on fire since 2020 onwards when Google released uh, SimCLR. So here's this example. We have this tile of a satellite. I think you, would Im you can imagine this is an ocean, there's a coastal fog, and there's a forest. Uh, but we don't have any labels. So what do we do to train a network when you can't do it supervised? Well, how about you take this image and then you rotate it randomly between zero to 360 degrees and you get this new augmented version. Now the image on the right and the image on the left are essentially the same thing, right? Imagine you take this image on the left and you crop it a little bit. They're both the same image at the end of the day, you know, as humans, we understand that. How about we change a little bit of the brightness, contrast, a little bit of hue, same image at the end of the day. So the idea is what if you take an image and do some augmentations and then you generate a new image and then let a neural network figure out that the image on the left and the image on the right is similar. So imagine you give it a lot of data, tons of data, you know, millions of examples. The system starts to essentially understand the meaning behind the concepts, uh, even though it doesn't have any labels. So it's essentially self-supervised learning. The self part here is important. So uh, this is essentially some CLR, but since then many new techniques have come up and uh, have really increased the metrics uh, in this field. So when we tried to do this for NASA, we, we, we basically thought about three principles that we want to employ. First, we want to make sure this is open source. We want to ensure this is modularized so that instead of like one gigantic system, we have these tiny modules for computer vision and they could be combined for many different problems beyond the problem NASA was trying to solve. Um, and we want it to be high performance. And lastly, we want it to be useful by anybody who does not know AI and they don't know coding. So as long as you can use a command line, you can use this. Okay, all right. So the way we did this is with this flow chart of this large system, where you go from the left side from data collection, all the way till the end, we are given one example we are able to generate an exhaustive set of all examples. All right, so let's. I'll, I'll take you through this. Don't worry, because flowcharts are too big. But TLDR, all those unique modules are available online, and you can mix and match them for any computer vision problem. That's how it goes. So let's say when we started, uh, turns out uh, downloading data uh, from NASA is work. So we built a simple tool to access any of the satellite imagery. All you do is you go on a command line and essentially write one line telling the starting and the end date, the coordinates, and it just downloads it on your machine. We want data to be great for training as one of those uh, ways to format the data. So the training speed performance of the system in the later part. And maybe you, know, you are somebody who uses TikTok a lot and you really want to talk about climate change. So you say minus minus animate and it just starts animating the Earth around us. This was the example from California from 2020. So uh, easy to that can be used by anybody in the command line. So now that we have the data, we now do what we talked about the theory, self-supervised learning. And to do that, you literally write this single line, Python train.py and uh, give it the path to all your images. And it just starts doing what it does best, training a network uh, on the command line really high performance, and it behind the scenes, it can even scale to multiple GPUs. And in case, now you happen to have a few examples which are labeled, you could then use another command to train a supervised classifier. So take a bunch of images, hundreds of thousands or millions of images to train a self-supervised model. And then you can, with a few labeled examples, train a supervised classifier. This is an example of, we gave it one day of earth data, 128 into 128 kilometer tiles. And it started to make some sense. Like when you go from the bottom to the top, I think the, should I say the wetness increases because it's the ocean at the top and, uh, and uh, deserts at the bottom. And when you go from left to right, the cloudiness increases as you can pre pretty much see. But if you were like more smarter than I am, you could use more pre-processing in it and essentially remove the clouds. And when you remove the clouds, we get more finer grained understanding of the, uh, basically of the system. So that's nice. We, are, we also need the system to be very high performance. So we don't want 
if you are not a deep learning performance guru, don't worry. The system automatically tries to be as high performant. So we essentially were able to train a bunch of this stuff on Google Collab free notebooks. Thanks, Google. Uh, and uh, this kind of shows the power of having efficient systems. So now that we have downloaded the data and trained a model, you want to keep it in the model store. Makes sense. Once you have the model store, you want to then pass all the data through this model into to generate these meaningful embeddings. So each image, which is a big image, is essentially now stored as a tiny embedding. Makes sense. And then finally, we use there are many open source nearest approximate nearest neighbor search libraries. ANNbenchmark.com, I think, has a whole bunch of uh, testing done on many open source libraries. Scan from Google is currently the leader in uh, the number of queries it can handle and at the speed. Uh, and as well as you have from Facebook, FAISS, you have Annoy from Spotify. So you can use any number of those libraries. The trick is divide and conquer. So what you do is uh, you take your data, depending on the resolution, depending on the date, and depending on the product, if it's an infrared product or if it's a product which is RGB, you divide and conquer and create embedding uh, indexes of each one of those. So during search time, depending on the image that's passed in and the user's parameters from first state to the last state, you can then load those indexes quickly and serve the user. So divide and conquer is a way to scale on the cloud. And then finally, you want the user to have a great experience. So the way we did this is we built a Chrome extension so that most of our users could download it uh, and try this out. Uh, by the way, you might be noticing the name of the researchers who did the work is at the bottom of my slide. So thanks to them. So this is great. So, so far what happened is nearest neighbor search API, we are able to return many similar examples of the same kind. That's great. So you go from one image to maybe 50, 60 images, uh, again, unlabeled. But maybe it's a good time to label data. So for that, what we did is we built Swipe Labeler. Uh, think of this as Tinder for NASA, because essentially a researcher can take this on their laptop, put the images in the unlabeled folder, and start swiping right or swiping left to indicate whether this is what they cared about or what they didn't care about. And even better, we realize researchers are not networking experts. So essentially, you can run on a mobile. More importantly, it gives you a link that you can share with your friends and colleagues. And now you can get uh, like a party of people labeling the data in front of you remotely while everything. Because remember, our client here is a scientist. networking side. All right, that sounds like a great idea. So we are able to take an image, search similar images, say 50, 60, and then take those images and label them left or right to know is it, uh, is it what the scientists wanted or not. So now let's say we had 30 positive images, 30 negative images. You can guess you can create a classifier here. And that's where I'm getting at. So could we improve the performance? Because we haven't found the exhaustive set. We have just found a few images. So what if we were able to train a classifier first, a supervised classifier, and that supervised classifier could then go over the entire billion image set and is able to find all the exhaustive images. And that's what we are gonna do. And how do we do this? Well, firstly, we have 30 positive, 30 negative images. We use a technique called active learning where a few images are labeled, we train then a class, a few images are labeled, like in the seed, we train a classifier. Uh, that model then runs on the unlabeled data and finds all examples that it's uncertain about and give it to a human to label. And then these human labeled images then go back to our labeled data set. So let's say we have 100 data points now. We have 60% F1 score. We do another forward pass on the entire data set, find more images that are confusing. And as you keep going this round and round using active labeling, with a few labeled examples, we are able to reach high F1 scores. And that's great because our underlying model was already trained. It's the few dense layers that need to be now trained to be able to uh, build a great model. That's great. Uh, we did some examples where we took uh, large data sets which would have taken 38 hours to label. 
And using this, we are able to label that in 2.9 hours. What we interestingly realize is the bigger the data set gets, the better the performance value that you can get for labeling comes out. And this is a, one of the problems in images. Images are slightly less structured. So I wish it was text because we could have done like much better with uh, a lot of discussion that we had today in the sessions today. Now, one last thing. Uh, the, the real good thing that I think the real uh, innovation we found was if you're doing this on a 10 billion image set, each forward pass of the classifier takes $30,000 and 21,000 hours. I don't got that kind of money. Uh, I don't know who has. Uh, and if you had to do 10 forward passes of active learning to do that, it would have taken $300,000, very expensive. So the idea we essentially came up with was, what if you take this uh, 10 billion image set and you had a small representative sample of let's say 100,000 images. Doing a forward pass on those 100,000 images takes about 13 minutes. And what we do is we keep on finding what we are bad at on those 100,000 images. But once we know what those images are that we are bad at, you then use our nearest neighbor API to actually find other 100 similar examples. So essentially you have access to those billions of images while you're still training on 100,000 because you can use the nearest neighbor API. So I call this access to billions and cost of pennies and that's really nice. We use this example of this one simple image out of five million potential images. And we had the job of finding every island on earth. So we took this image uh, and we are able to identify a thousand islands on earth in about 52 minutes. Keep in mind, we had literally done nothing 52 minutes ago here. So the point here was if you had manually done this, this would have taken $105,000. But with citizen science, we are able to kind of get it done pricelessly. We are even able to apply this once we build this. Um, as I'm about to end, uh, uh, researchers saw this presentation and without us knowing, they started applying this on Hubble Space Telescope data, on Voyager and other space missions. And that kind of showed the power of having things available in open source so anybody can use and lowering the bar to entry in AI. So as I end this, I want to introduce our scientists. Uh, at NASA has an AI accelerator called Frontier Development Labs. Usually 50% of the folks who enter there are PhDs, 40% are postdocs, so you can see the area here. All this work actually was done by majority high school students. And uh, this shows the power of uh, you know, being able to devise systems uh, where you lower the bar to entry for people and give them the motivation to do crazy things. You got people from uh, six to seven different countries around the world. And uh, we had people who had never coded in their life like an English teacher who went on this mission and today teaches data science uh, one and a half years later. So that's the power of citizen science and thank you for listening to me today. Amazing. Thanks so much, Cool. That was a very cool presentation. Sorry, <laughs> had to do it. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, excited comments in the chat as well, but with people saying that it's been incredible work, very interesting as well. So thank you so much. Um, so now we'll take on some questions. We have a question from Nick that says, very impressive, impressive imagery work coming out of NASA. Maybe you touched on this, but are you using um, an approach like SIMCSE for semantic text similarity? I think there are groups who are trying to use uh, uh, similarity for text and even like combining image and text for matching things. Um, just an interesting uh, fact. Turns out there's a collection of papers, over 100,000 papers uh, that are presented by these scientists and they actually mention the data set and sometimes the image we associated with it. So if you knew that, could you be have joined them together to learn concepts and make it available for people? So there are people who are doing that good work. I'm not that person. <laughs> Amazing, but that's good to know that uh, you know maybe there are techniques that are transferable or people are doing that work and the data sets at least exist. So uh, opportunity there. Another question, uh, one of the PowerPoint images had cloud on the, I'm guessing right-hand side and the right or on the on one of the sides and the right hand side had a cloudless image. How did you determine that the area below was water body and not just like a desert, let's say? Yeah, so keep in mind with self-supervised learning, we don't know what this image really means. It's for the human to interpret at the end of the day. Uh, 
it just happened that the when the system started clustering the images, it started to make some sort of a sense. And that kind of shows that the model actually makes sense, uh, that it has started to pick up the concepts of uh, you know, how to transition from uh, small sites to the other sites. We had like some really great examples that if we had, we were able to like zoom in like 5X inside these, which even I can't do here. Uh, those little examples of like different kinds of forests as they were transitioning towards the more ocean side of things uh, that we are able to essentially get out of this. So I think I'll take this that this, the system is smart enough to be able to get that once you have enough number of images. Got it. Uh, sort of a related question, I guess somebody's asking about, you know, what about mountains? Because the top in square feet is too high and then that's covered by clouds. So I guess in general, maybe how weather conditions and, and the time of the day that the photo was taken, like affects uh, the system. Certainly. So, so here's, here's a great example. And this is a really good point. You could take the image of a piece of land today and the next month and say that this and this is essentially the same. Hey, since, uh, you know, hey, self-supervised gods, figure out why. So that's like one example that you could also use for training a system like this. So so you're spot on on uh, the system has to become robust. Mm -hmm. uh, so we actually provided both kinds of examples. Uh, and in case I was breaking while presenting, might be because I'm actually at on top of a hill at 10,000 feet. <laughs> uh, that might be the reason. Got it. Got it. Uh... Amazing. Um, so I just wanted to double click on some of the points that you touched on just to make sure I understood. Uh, you know, you're, you're doing this self-supervised uh, approach to figure out if, if two, like basically if two images are similar, learning the same embeddings, et cetera. Just wanted to make sure I understand like when you then query or do inference, you have so many images to search from to get that embedding that is similar. Is that the nearest neighbor search API that we're talking about? Which is like, how do you even know which images to compare to and make that be as efficient as possible. This is why we say beg, borrow, steal. If somebody has done the work, why don't you just reuse that? So right. the whole area of approximate nearest neighbor search is built for not being a, like a hundred percent accurate method to find similar things. But generally, this but generally things uh, with with some level of guarantee, like 80, 90 percent, finding those examples in sub millisecond latency. Uh, in our example, we actually made it in two different ways. One way was if you have uh, a million images or under, a researcher could run this on their own laptop and be able to oh, wow. like do this. But if you know you have more deeper pockets, you could use uh, one of the templates we have on uh, cloud to be able to essentially run this with like a much bigger thing. And the whole point is that you don't even need to know behind the scenes what AR programming is. Oh, cool. I think you may be cutting out slightly. Oh, okay, now you're back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, got it. So it's sort of reusing that work. I guess one sort of um, sort of related question, but sort of tangential, something that Dylan was talking about too, the the uh, dimensions of that image do matter sometimes, you know, because, you know, if, if the image is too small, everything would look similar. If it's too large, then obviously, but then there's compute implications. So how do you make that trade-off between image size and then also just the speed and how did you land on the optimal level there? Excellent, excellent question. So uh, I'm so glad I'm in the room where people are thinking exactly the real problem. <laughs> so uh, I can go two angles, right? So the one was like a excellent way of doing it and that's how you do face uh, recognition or face detection. You usually use some sort of a pyramid network because in an image, the face could be small or big, right? So that's one way of doing that. But the amount of time it will take to debug and like really make it work would be like a stretch goal. So maybe let's do is you take the world and actually divide it into tiles, which are 1,000 kilometers, 500 kilometers, 256 kilometers, 128 kilometers, and build like multiple resolutions of it and just label it. It will cost more, but right. um, usually people who are searching might have... Uh, have some idea of like how big things will be. So hurricanes, for example, are usually not going to be 500 kilometer, uh, 500 miles or bigger. So we know like which area to like click it in. Got it. So it depends on sort of what you're trying to detect as well as, you know, it, it does help to experiment a little bit to see what the optimal size could be maybe is what I'm mean. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Uh, if people do have more questions, I know you had your email up at the end. If you could just flash that up uh, so that people can reach out if they have more questions. 
uh, we're, we're really, really interesting work. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you and hope you all have a great day.